Thank you. Well, and that was a nice breather after some very difficult Bible readings. That believe it or not, I have the sermon titled Grace in the Garden. So we'll look at these together and see what we come up with. So now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So today's texts are in a word, sobering. I feel the need to put that out there right from the start. Difficult to hear and difficult, yes, to preach on. It's so much easier when hope and possibility and everlasting love are right there front and center. No such luck today. But that's what happens when we follow a lectionary as we do in the Lutheran tradition. We get to deal with readings as they come and sometimes they feature topics we'd rather gloss over. So yes, today's readings are hard, but that doesn't mean they're bad. For sobering as they are, they speak to our experience because we all know the feeling of love gone awry. The woman arrived on time for her, apart, uh, her appointment. I figured she would. For when I met her for the first time at church the week before, I could read desperation all over her face. She took a seat, and she lost her composure before even the first word came out of her mouth. Her marriage was over. Her spouse had moved out, having found a replacement relationship. The woman's heart and pride and self-esteem were all ripped into. She was hurt and she was angry and she was unmoored from the anchor that held her to that identity of wife and partner. Different temperaments, different values clearly had taken their toll over the years and she and her husband grew apart. Conversation became more caustic as it devolved from dialogue into a series of pot shots. As I listened to her story, it was clear that the woman was still completely emotionally involved with her estranged husband. But the love had been replaced with other emotions, vengeance, fear, grief, even hatred. These controlled her thoughts, and she didn't know how to get beyond them. To be sure, this isn't the only way that love goes awry. I've shared time in my office with grandparents who thought that having grandchildren would be like the culmination to life's journey. But as the years have passed, there's increasing tension between the generations as the priorities of the parents and as a result, the grandchildren differ from the grandparents. Habits and values that the grandparents have held dear from church attendance on down the line have been set aside for new, more secular concerns. Wisdom from the elders isn't sought or particularly even valued and they feel hurt. I hear stories from you about so-called forever friends who disappoint, about parents who show favoritism or who aren't investing the time that they should in their children's lives. Love goes awry. It brings pain when it happens in families, in personal relationships, and in communities, why it even happens without our thinking about it as we participate in societies that allow poor and disenfranchised groups to simply fall off the grid. Yes, love goes awry to us, and it goes awry through us, and it impacts our relationship with God. And today's lessons acknowledge that God grieves when love goes awry and the cost is heavy. The Old Testament reading that Celia shared with us and the gospel, they both put us on the hot seat. Through the pro 
prophet Isaiah, God sings a beautiful love song to ancient Israel. And like all great love songs, it's poetic and it's visual. God images Israel like this beautiful vineyard. And God describes how God expresses love by nurturing the vineyard, by protecting it, by pouring so much love into this vineyard that God feels reasonably sure that its fruit is going to be healthy and it's going to be profuse. Love is like that, isn't it? It starts out so joyful and so filled with unbridled optimism. God, the parable reveals, God is faithful to this relationship. After all, do you remember, God doesn't just show love, God is love. So God's disposition doesn't change. But the vineyard, different story. The vineyard's love goes awry. Instead of yielding grapes, it yields wild grapes. Isaiah names the vineyard Israel and describes the wild grapes of the harvest of their lives, nothing less than bloodshed, the cries of enmity, sharing hate rather than love. God's loving intentions have been disregarded and they have been abused. So God responds with the only consequence that God is left to give. Remove the hedge. Let it grow wild. Give the vineyard what it wants. The lesson ends with brokenness and hurt on both sides. Yes, an emotional connection still exists, but God is grieved and the perpetrator is abandoned. The relationship is wounded and dialogue ceases. Centuries later, Jesus knows that the religious leaders of Judaism are going to recognize that vineyard image when he tells them a parable. They'll know he's referring to Israel. But in this story, the focus isn't so much on the vineyard itself, but on the tenants who care for it. Now, we're not told the details of the financial arrangement between the tenants and the landowner, but the parable makes very clear that the owner has rights to the harvest. So he sends a group of slaves to collect it, but the tenants beat and kill them. The owner sends a second group, bigger than the first. And no surprise, the same thing happens. You know that saying, you wrong me once, it's your fault. You wrong me twice, it's mine. Well, get this, the owner sends his son the next time into now a well-established pattern of abuse. To the tenants, the fact he's the landowner's son is like the jackpot. All the more reason to kill him. For in their delusional mindset, they figure maybe they'll get the inheritance. Oh, the crazy things we can convince ourselves of when we want to rationalize our behavior. Well, meeting out the punishment that the tenants deserve isn't exactly rocket science. And the religious leaders are the first ones to render the judgment. They say to Jesus, get rid of the existing tenants, replace them with ones that will allow the landowner to reap his land, they say. Too bad. It's analogous to the manner in which they've received the man and the message of Jesus turns out the parable is a mirror for the religious elite and they're challenged to gaze into it and see themselves they're angered by the suggestion and they want to arrest jesus but see the crowds are mesmerized i read in a commentary this week that Martin Luther once said that sometimes you have to squeeze a biblical passage until it leaks the gospel. And I think that's true today. Because our lessons, they scream judgment. And the good news is not readily discerned. I mean, if these readings don't make you uncomfortable, I suggest you go back and read them again. Because they should. We read of demand, consequence, and it's sobering. 
But because God is love, remember, there is still a promise laced within the texts. So stay with me as we discover grace in the garden. The parables are both like landmines thrown by prophets. The first one by Israel and the second one by Jesus to groups who have caused God's love to go awry. Isaiah directs his lament to a proud and successful ancient Israel, whereas Jesus' time bomb drops in the vicinity of the chief priests and the Pharisees shortly after his Palm Sunday entry into Jerusalem. So yes, each parable, they have an historical context. But if we leave these parables right at the feet of Israel and its leaders and interpret them only as exposés of the, Jew- of the Jewish nations, why, we've missed the point entirely. Then all we're doing is the very same things that the stories lament. We're rejecting God's call in our lives to engage in kingdom behaviors. And those are things like compassion and understanding and generosity and justice and love. We become overgrown with narrowness and hatred, just as the parables describe. So there's something else going on. Thanks be to God. There's grace in the garden. Oh, it takes some squeezing, but the never-failing love of God is there amidst the weeds of rancor. For like the wealthy landowner who sends his son to the tenants, knowing full well what's going to happen... Our God sends Jesus to live and dwell among us, knowing full well that he would suffer and die, knowing full well that he would rise victorious from the grave. Do you see? Even when the vineyards of our lives are filled with briars and thorns, even when love goes awry, whether it's our fault or somebody else's, There's the possibility of a new narrative because of Jesus. So you see, our readings, they give us an opportunity today to come clean, to acknowledge that we, like the ancient Israelites, like the religious leaders in Jesus' time, we are broken people. Life and love disappoint us. Not because God is not loving and faithful, but because we are not loving and faithful. We don't love the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. And we don't love our neighbor as ourselves. We experience heartache in relationships. And we need to own a piece of the reason why. We become so consumed in our own lives why we don't even see the injustices that we participate in. We use these plentiful gifts that God gives us in creation to satisfy our own needs as we describe them so we don't even hear the landowner calling us to share. Our love, it goes awry. But when we squeeze the texts, We discover a God who nurtures us in love. The very son that we reject is the cornerstone when we embrace a new life in Christ and we build our lives in him. There's forgiveness. There's reconciliation. There's renewal at this very table where we hear, this is my body, this is my blood, given and shed for you. Our capacity to love may be insufficient, but God's is not. So filled with that meal, we go, compelled to share love with our neighbor. Some Protestant denominations name today World Communion Sunday. In our own synod, our bishop has proclaimed it Global Church Sunday. Both expressions remind us that God's vineyard is no less than all of creation. And despite our brokenness, there is grace in the garden. We are one family around this table of grace, and we are called to love each other and build our lives on a message of reconciliation. So as we read today's parables today, Let us see ourselves 
in the mirror and let us cling to the cornerstone that is our Lord because he is amazing in our eyes. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I love that amen. <laughs> creator of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 
And now with the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Sing a love song to us, O God, with verses that rouse us to be the church in a world where faith is met with cynicism. Lift us out of complacency to share the priceless gift of knowing Christ. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Sing a love song to us, O God, with verses that motivate us to rebuild where storms have torn down and droughts have sucked dry. Sing verses that provoke us to create change where there is injustice, freedom where there is captivity, and harmony where there is violence. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Sing a love song to us, O God, with verses that compel us to provide relief to those who suffer, comfort to those who mourn, protection to those who are vulnerable, and compassion to those who are scorned. Be with armed forces throughout the world, and be with those we now name aloud or silently. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Sing a love song to us, O God, with verses that assure us of eternal life, where together with all your saints we will join you in a song that has no end. So now, trusting in your mercy and goodness, we bring before you these prayers and whatever else you see that we need. In the name of the one who sets us free, Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. And now you may be seated as we continue to worship God with our offerings. were gathered together to become one bread. 
So let your church be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory through Jesus Christ now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We live to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Oh uh-huh. 
remain seated. Merciful God, you are the host at every meal. At this table, you spread out a feast for all peoples. Send us from this banquet to invite others into these good things and let justice roll down like waters and to care for the least of our brothers and sisters. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Just a couple of announcements before I send you on your way. Good morning once again and welcome. My name is Pastor Katie. It is my honor to serve as the pastor here. If you are visiting a very special word of welcome, please take a red or blue little bag on the narthex table as you leave today and give us a record of your visit through the pew card, which should be right in front of the pew rack right in front of you so that you can uh, give us some way that I might contact you during the week. We had a wonderful pledge emphasis during September. If you have not had the opportunity to turn in your financial pledge for the new year, you're invited to do so if you choose, and that can be done through the pledge forms that are located also on the Narthex table. I also want to highlight uh, two folks. Pam Admire's mother died this week, so we lift the Admire family in our prayers. Her mother um, was a charter member of Christ the King. Also, Dave Ziska was hospitalized yesterday. Today is a busy day. We started with a fantastic adult education class between worship services. It's not too late to get involved. If you come to the 10 o'clock service, just come an hour early and you can feast on what it means to be Lutheran. Also, our Christ the King dancers meet immediately after worship today. Our final of our new member series happens today at 4.30 and then there is a Thrivent dinner after that. Our women of the ELCA are collecting towels for Chapman Partnership. Also, you can get a shoe box and fill that with Christmas goodies for uh, needy children overseas. You can learn about that in Letter Hall. I'm going to invite Christy Bettendorf forward. As I also mentioned, October is the Elephant Bazaar Month, so read all about it and plan to participate. Christy. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that this morning we begin sign-ups for our Oktoberfest event. Oktoberfest this year is going to be on Saturday, October 25th. Uh, we will have, as we always do, that wonderful dinner and a special beer because it's Oktoberfest. And uh, this year, uh, Deanna Mall is putting something wonderful together for your children. Uh, they're going to have a Halloween cost, uh, party. They can come in costume. And she's uh, orchestrating all sorts of crafts and things that they will do. So um, for children 13 and over, they can join the adults back in Letter Hall. For children 12 and under, they're going to have a, just as good a time as we are back there enjoying our dinners and listening to the music and having a wonderful time. So sign-ups begin today. Um, think about whether or not you would like to host a table and make a, a lovely centerpiece for your table, or if you would like to join another table that someone else is hosting, or if you just want to sign up as a single or a couple, the Fellowship Commission will be putting tables together, and so any way you want to arrange it, we can accommodate it. Sign up, start today, and we'll go for the next two weeks. Thank you. Finally, I just want to highlight next Sunday, immediately after this service, Callie will be holding, Callie Howland, our ministry associate, be holding a meeting about the ELCA youth gathering. If you have a youth, please consider having them go. It is a truly life-changing event. So now let us rise and join together in a closing blessing and final hymn.
and remember Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.